First Samuel. We're getting into it now. According to my Bible, we're 234 pages in already. Three twenty-four. <laughs> oh, you have the journaling Bible, so they smush the the columns. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, you might have one or two more join us. We got a couple people online. Hello, YouTubers and Facebookers. Let me uh, pray for us, and we'll jump into 1 Samuel. So let's pray. Father, as we come to you, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can be here together tonight. Uh, we rejoice in the good things that you are doing in our lives. And, and Lord, in those things that are tough and challenging, we pray that you will give us strength uh, to, to handle those things well, to your glory, to endure, Lord, and to uh, give you glory in the middle of that. We Thank you for this church. We thank you for uh, this time to get together to just do a biblical overview, Lord, and, and just look at these themes and let them encourage us and talk about these things. Help us now by your spirit to do that well. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, first Samuel. Let's see if I can get to my slide. There we go. All right, some intro stuff. For First Samuel, another book written by Anon Emus. We don't really know who it was. Most people think it was Samuel. I don't know. It was around 1000 B.C. And as far as redemptive history, this is the part where Israel really crystallizes itself in becoming a nation and, and getting a king. And I came across this theme statement today. This is not mine, so I can't take credit for it. But if somebody were to say a theme of First Samuel, perhaps this would be a good one. God rules his people through the king who is a representative of the people and whose actions will bring God's blessing or punishment. Right? So we, we see the, the establishment of the king, the monarchy, and what that means for Israel. All right? But first, let's talk about Samuel himself. All right? So some background to Samuel. Samuel 1. Maybe somebody could read uh, Samuel 1, 1 and 2, just to kind of get us started, get us pushed away from the dock, so to speak, you know, a little boating term, if anybody's with me. Somebody read Samuel 1, 1 through 2. I know there's a big word right there, everybody's staring that down. <laughs> Ramath Aim Zafim. Oh, I'll just read it. In the hill country of Ephraim. <laughs> There was a man from Ramathaim Zophim in the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zoph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives, scandal. The first was named Hannah, and the second, Penaniah. Penaniah had children, but Hannah was childless. And so that's kind of the background here. And if you know 1 Samuel well, you know that this goes into um, Hannah's kind of sadness in that and the taunting that she got from Penaniah. And, and she runs into uh, Eli at the temple and she's there fervently praying. And Eli wins pastor of the year because he sensitively says to her, how long are you going to continue being drunk, woman? And she's not drunk at all. She's just there praying. So I don't know how he equated those two things, but I guess we'll learn more about Eli in a little while. Eli had some issues himself. So she says, no, I am, I am not. I am a woman with a broken heart. I've not had any wine or beer. I promise. And she says in 16, uh, I've been praying from the depth of my anguish and resentment. And Eli says, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant the request You've made of him. And she says in 18, don't play with me, Eli. Well, that's not what she says, actually. She says, may your servant find favor with you. And lo and behold, it comes true, right? But we see, just to stop a moment, we see, we see uh, uh, Hannah in fervent prayer for this. 
right? And I guess a good question is this, you know, obviously we're in the book of Samuel. Obviously we know that Hannah's going to have a baby. We know the baby's going to be named Samuel, right? Spoiler alert, like it doesn't take that much to figure that out. So why is she like fervently praying for this? Like it, it, it's kind of like if God is going to do it anyway, then you know what I'm trying to say? You know what I'm trying to get at here? What do you think, Lily? Why do we pray? Oh, you have a you have a book about Samuel? Oh, you guys are always so good. Grandpa gave you a book about this very thing with Hannah, and she was praying so hard because she wanted a baby, right? And the Lord said yes. That's so good. Good job. Thank you. But what do we think, though? I mean, God's obviously going to do this, right? And it's obviously going to serve a huge purpose. But did God do it because? Hannah prayed, or did God do it because he's God? Yes. <laughs> this is true. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Scripture tells us later on, I think it's Thessalonians, right? Pray at all times with all kinds of requests. Um, pray continuously, right? And, and we pray from the depths of our heart. And, and even as Christians, we have that, like the Holy Spirit kind of corrects our prayers, you know, as we pray. Because sometimes we don't know what to pray for. Uh, but Hannah, of course, wanted a child from the depths of her heart, and it was God's plan all along that we'll see uh, to bring Samuel, to bring the king, to continue to solidify Israel and all of that. And so those two things work together perfectly in God's sovereignty, right? That he actually involves us in his plans. Like, he doesn't wait for us to pray. Like, he's not wringing our hands like whatever it was eight years ago. He's not wringing his hands going, boy, I really want to plant Highlands Bible Church. I just wish somebody would pray for it, and then we could get going here. No, he was already, already on the move with all of that stuff. But as we pray, his plan comes to fruition as well. It's just such a, it's such a cool thing to think about, that he involves us in his plans Prayer is the means to the end. That's how he accomplishes his plans. But yet, overall, he's still sovereign over it, over all. It's, it's one of those cool things to think about, you know? Sometimes we just think that God's going to work automatically, um, which he certainly could. But he works in response to prayer. And that's just a great thing, such a powerful thing to think about. So the Lord hears our prayers, and Samuel was born in verse 20. Samuel actually means uh, the Lord hears or heard of God. It's actually a, a derivative of that word Shema when we were looking at the Deuteronomy 6. It's that Hebrew word Shema, El. El always is kind of a, a shorthand for God. So God hears is actually literally Samuel. Cool thing flying by in the middle of Hannah's triumphant prayer, which is just a beautiful. This woman was a theologian, man. She was deep. In verse 6, we come across what I have affectionately stolen from one of my professors, Dr. Bruce Ware, the spectrum, one of our spectrum texts. In 1 Samuel 2, 6, it says, The Lord brings death and gives life. He sends some down to Sheol and he raises others up. The Lord brings poverty and gives wealth. He humbles and he exalts. And if we keep going, he raises poor from the dust and he lifts the needy from the trash heap. He seats them with noblemen and gives them a throne of honor for the foundations of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world on them. Just as she goes on and on and on. But, but just the magnitude of God's sovereignty in that, right? Another spectrum text where she you know, comes right and says, the Lord brings death and gives life. And it's like, what do, what do we do with that? What do we do with the spectrum text like that? How are they? Are they a comfort to us? Or are they a conflation to our brains? How does it, when we think about things like this and his magnitude, what sorts of things are resonating in your, in your wonderful brains? 
our hearts, our thoughts. I will pause for a dramatic drink of water. Am I the only one that stops and pauses when something like that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's in total control. And it is, oddly enough, a comfort, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's the truth. None of his promises, I like how he said that, none of his promises could stand if he was not absolutely sovereign, right? And we're, we're all down with the second part. He gives life. We're not so much down with the first part, right? The Lord brings death. No, 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 I don't want that one, right? Uh, same thing. The Lord brings poverty. No thanks. The Lord gives wealth. Yes, I'll take that, right? But he's, he's sovereign over all of it and all of it to his plan and all of it in his perfect wisdom. All right, so Samuel grows. He serves Eli the priest. Eli the priest is not doing well, especially Eli's sons are not doing well. We don't really have time to get into Eli's sons, but they are bad, bad boys. All right, so he's Phineas and Ferb. <laughs> what are their actual names? Phineas and Hophni and Phineas. <laughs> Phineas and Ferb. I love that. That's awesome. So in chapter 3, we have the famous call of Samuel. Little Samuel is with Eli at night, right? And the Lord calls him, right? Um, in verse 4, the Lord called Samuel and he answered, Here I am. He ran to Eli and said, What's up? <laughs> you called? And he's like, No, I, I didn't call. What are you talking about? And it happens again, right? Samuel, he gets up. He goes, Okay, seriously, you called me that time. What do you want? And he says, I didn't. And look at verse 7 of chapter 3. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord because the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Once again, for the third time, the Lord called Samuel. He got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. Quit calling me. And then Eli had enough sense to know, Go and lay down. If he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went down and laid his place. Right, And it happens again. And he says, Speak, your, your servant is listening. But what are some things that we can pull out of just that, that episode of God calling him three times? You know, his response. What are some things that that jump out at us. Think gospel thoughts. <laughs> He's totally obedient. Yep. He thought it was Eli. Yep. Should make sense. He hears voices at night. He gets up. There's probably only one other guy there, so... Yeah. What about the idea of the, he was calling, were you actually going to raise your hand there, young lady? What were you? I was just thinking about when it says the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Oh, she's on to something. So it's, you know, when, when the call was called, the, the Holy Spirit was opening our hearts yeah. to the Lord and, re, and re, he revealed himself to us. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I thought of too. Because Samuel, right? Samuel, you could say, using gospel language, wasn't saved yet, right? But he f keeps following the call. He keeps, you know, the Lord keeps calling. The Lord has set his, his spirit upon him. He has a mission for him. He has a calling for him. And he is not going to let Samuel go, right? So he continues to call. He continues. Just like as I think it was Spurgeon they used to say, the hounds of heaven will come after those, the elect, Right? You reformed Baptists in the back row are laughing at me. But like, if, you know, he's not, he's not going to lose any that the Father has given him. So he's going to continue to do that. I love that. He didn't know the Lord, but still, the Lord had set his sights upon him, and he had a mission, and he had something to do for the Lord. So it's, it's a picture of salvation, really, in that way. A little bit of a gospel stretch, but, you know, I think you can give it to me. You know, it's a picture, it's a picture of salvation in that, right? So speak again. Listen, the play on words is really cool too in the Hebrew because he says, uh, speak for your servant is listening, right? Samuel, God hears is now Samuel, the one who's listening to 
God who heard him in the first place. It's like a weird, geeky circle of Hebrew. Um, so then, what about us in this? When we hear the word of the Lord, are we more like Samuel? Well, all of us obviously heard the call because we're here on a Wednesday night and only Christians would be in church on a Wednesday night. <laughs> but the Lord continues to call us. The Lord continues to call us deeper into himself, right? Are we continuing to heed the call of the Lord? Are we continuing to grow? Are we continuing to kill sin? Are we continuing to come back to him? Are we continuing all of that? Reminded of that Psalm 16 where it says, uh, What shall I give to the Lord for all of his benefits that he has given me? I will call upon the name of the Lord. Right? I will continue. In the Hebrew it says, I will continue to call. I will continue to go back to the Lord because he's my source of life. Right? So is that us that we continue to go back to the Lord? All right. Chapters 4 through 6, we basically have some battles we have the loss of the ark into philistine hands which is a really cool story because the philistines realize that they don't want the ark because people start dying because the lord isn't upset with them and and, and what we kind of the the way that the ark is sometimes treated right is more like a lucky rabbit's foot than it is the ark of God. And sometimes we see that, and especially, I think, when the Philistines get it, because they don't have any idea what it is, any idea what it is. But it's not a lucky rabbit's foot, obviously. It's, in that case, it's the symbol of the presence of the Lord. Right? So it is, it is not certainly just a, a good luck charm. Right? Um, chapter 7, Samuel then gives a challenge to Israel in 7 verse 3. Now there's not very many, there's no scary names in there, so can someone read Samuel, 1 Samuel 7 3 for us? Anyone at all? Okay. No, no, you're good. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Joanne. It sounds familiar, right? It's kind of one of those things we hear over and over and over again in the Old Testament, right? Especially once we get out of the Pentateuch and we get more into uh, Joshua and, and on and on and on in Samuel and Kings. Um, if you're returning to the Lord with all your heart, get rid of the foreign gods, right? This problem, again, that Israel is continuing to worship false gods. And it's, it's directly connected here to what? Then he will rescue you from the Philistines. It's like Israel always knew when God was with them because they started kicking butt, right? The enemies could not stand before them, right? Hundreds gave flight to thousands, right? But now you can always tell when the Lord is not with them, when they are not following the Lord because the same thing happens. In reverse, it happens. They are not defeating their enemies, right? And so Samuel has challenged them, and he says, if you're returning to the Lord with all your heart, get rid of foreign gods and the asterisks or the, the way that they worship uh, some of the, the pantheon of foreign gods, what about us? We just passed a passage in, on Sunday where Jesus said that he is not abolishing the law and the prophets. He is fulfill, he's fulfilling them. So how do we, so, so we're Christians on a Wednesday night in Sussex County in 1 Samuel 7, 3. What, is this, what does this verse mean to us as believers? Does this still apply to us? Are we still bound to this? Or did Jesus change that in some way? What is... What's that? Yep. Yes. Ooh, bonus points for quoting Calvin. Yes. Yeah. We are still in the business of, you guys are on fire tonight with these quotes, these little, these little s snippets you're coming up with. We're still in the business of getting rid of idols. 
That doesn't change. Human heart is still an idol factory, as was quoted. Right? And so, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so they're not the pantheon of the gods of the Canaanites or the Philistines, but they're the pantheon of the gods of the Americans, right? And all of our comforts and all of our leisure and all of our money and all of our sex or all of our substances or whatever else's status or whatever else it's going to be, right? So we're still in that business. So, so Jesus, again, when he says, I didn't abolish this, like this didn't get erased, this just takes on new meaning for us. Okay. Big chunk in 8 through 15. 8 starts the demand for the king. What kind of happens again, unfortunately, maybe Samuel uh, heard some of Eli's uh, bad habits. Right? And... He did not watch over his sons the way he should have watched over his sons. I'll read from uh, 1 Samuel 8. It says, When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges over Israel. His firstborn son was named Joel, and his second name was Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. However, his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned towards dishonest prophet, took bribes, and perverted justice. So all the elders gathered together and went to Samuel at Ramah. And they said, look, you are old. Thanks very much for that. And your sons don't walk in your ways. Therefore, appoint a king to judge us the same as all the other nations have. Right. So this is when they, they finally come out with it. They say, look, this isn't working out. Your kids are no better than Eli's kids. They're terrible, too, you know. We want a king. And, you know, we would think, like, is this, is this really part of God's plan? Or is this something that is just kind of, they're, they're concocting this. And, and look at what God says. He goes to, Samuel goes to God, and then the Lord tells him in verse 7, listen, to, do what they say. Like, listen to the people, right? Do what they say. He says, and besides, they've not rejected you They've rejected me as their king. So stop taking it so personally, right? They've not rejected you. They've rejected me as king. How, how, what's the dynamic there? How, what's the interplay? How have they rejected God as their king? Yeah, Em. Um, yeah. 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 It's weird. It's like global peer pressure or something. Like, everybody has a king. I want a king, too. Yeah. 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 And that pattern is unfortunately going to repeat itself once we get into David. David's not going to win Father of the Year awards in, in many categories. Yeah, so we see that. But is this actually just something that they have concocted out of thin air? That they said, ah, we just want a king. And God says, ah, just let him have it. What's the worst that could happen? Or is this prophesied somewhere else, maybe in the book of Deuteronomy, <laughs> where we read it before. Deuteronomy 17, 14. It's so funny how all of this stuff actually comes true. Deuteronomy 17, 14. God says, when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, take possession of it, live in it, and say... I will set a king over me like all the other nations around me. You are to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. Right? He knew exactly that this was going to happen. He, he, he foretold this and now years and years and years later it actually comes to fruition. Right? And so, yeah, 
we see again another, another case of, yeah, this is something they really wanted. Yes, yeah, Samuel really screwed up. They really do need a leader. They want something. They're coveting what the other nations have. So it's like sinfulness in their hearts that they want that. But who's sovereign over all of that? God, again. God's sovereign over sin. God's sovereign over their hearts. He's using what's in their hearts to once again accomplish his plan in that. Right? And so, yeah, they, they pretty much think they just want a king because everybody else has a king. And in so doing, they're doing more of rejecting God than they think they are with that. Because God is their king. Right? Ironically enough, in, in this, one of the scenes in the crucifixion, I don't know if it, or right before the, the arrest of Jesus and all of that, right? We have that, um, that scene where they trot out... Um, Barabbas, right? And, and Pilate says, should I release Barabbas or should I release Jesus? And they said, no, you know, release Barabbas, right? And then he says, but Jesus is your king. Do you remember what they say after that? We have no king but Caesar, which is like, <laughs> especially when you think about this. Like, like these words, they've not rejected you, they've rejected me. Right? And then you see that again when Jesus, and they literally say, we have no king but Caesar. They reject God. Caesar is your king? Really? How about Yahweh? Like, read your history books. Really? But yet again, even when, when Jesus comes into the picture, they, they dare to say that. Showing again the depths of their rejection of God himself, which is terrifying uh, to them. Especially it's like, yeah, give us Barabbas. What about Jesus? Oh, crucify him. Okay, cool. You guys are really, really on a good track here. Okay, so they want a king because everybody else has a king then. So the Lord picks Saul, who is a, Benjamin, a Benjaminite. And I think we've talked about Benjamin a couple times. They are jacked up. And we will see Saul uh, living up to his reputation. So 1 Samuel 9 one through two, there was a prominent man of Benjamin named Kish, son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bechorath, son of Aphiah, uh, son of a Benjamite. He had a son named Saul, an impressive young man. There was no one more impressive among the Israelites than he. He stood a head taller than everyone else, right? Because we all know that tall people are cooler than everybody else for some reason. I don't know why they say that. Okay, so it's Saul. We know that, right? Saul is anointed king. Uh, Samuel warns them again. We just have a couple chapters kind of worth of other things where Saul's received as king, where uh, they deliver in Jabesh Gilead. He's confirmed as king. And then Samuel kind of comes up to center stage again in chapter 12. And he says the same basic thing again in chapter 12, 14. If you fear the Lord, worship and obey him. And if you don't rebel against the Lord's command, then both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God. However, if you disobey the Lord and rebel against his command, the Lord's hand will be against you as it was against your ancestors. Can't say he didn't warn them, right? Time and time again. This is like, again, when Jesus says to the Pharisees, like the prophets came and the prophets warned you and what did you do with the prophets you ignored them or you killed them right Samuel again warning 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 and it's going to continue as we get into the bigger names right the Isaiah's the Jeremiah's all of that is going to continue in all in that warning Saul then has a colossal failure you know oh wait there's another part of the warning that I really like in verse 21 of chapter 12 he says, don't turn away to follow worthless things that can't profit or rescue you. They are worthless. The Lord will not abandon his people because of his great name and because he has determined to make you his own people, right? And he's kind of highlighting there the, the faithfulness of the Lord God, but still, you know, against the backdrop of their, their unfaithfulness, right? So chapter 13, we have the colossal failure of Saul, so Saul goes out. They're going to go out to uh, battle against the pesky Philistines again. Paul goes out, and, or Saul goes out in uh, verse 7. We see that 
all his troops were gripped with fear. Now, what's supposed to happen is that Samuel's supposed to show up and Samuel's supposed to offer the sacrifice to be pleasing to the Lord, right? Saul can't wait. Because why? All his army is turning against him. They're all consumed with fear, right? And so Saul decides, can't wait for Samuel. I'm doing this myself. Bring me, he says uh, uh, in verse 9, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. Then he offered the burnt offering. Major, no, no. You can't do that. The only one who can do that is Samuel at this time. Not King Saul. Not your job. Saul taking matters into his own hands out of fear. Just as he finished offering the burnt offering, wouldn't you know it, verse 10, here comes Samuel. <laughs> Samuel's like, hey, Saul, what are you, what are you doing? You can't, you can't do that, right? And then Saul says in verse 11, when I saw that the troops were deserting me and didn't come with the appointed, and you didn't come within the appointed days, and the Philistines were gathering at Michmash, I thought the Philistines will now descend on me in Gilgal, and I have blah, 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 and so I offered the sacrifice. Right? This is just complete and total fear talking. And it caused Saul to do something that was not his job. And Samuel says to Saul in verse 13, You have been foolish. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. It was at this time that the Lord would have permanently established your reign over Israel, but now your reign will not endure. The Lord has found a man after his own heart, and he's appointed him ruler. Right? So this is much bigger than just Saul doing something that he wasn't supposed to do. Right? It showed, again, public distrust of the Lord God. And as the king and as the leader, that just can't happen. I mean, think about it with Moses. That's what will happen with Moses as well. So Saul fails. And so I, I found it kind of funny when uh, Samuel says, you have acted foolishly, or you have been foolish. Does that mean that he called him a fool from our passage on Sunday? We were talking about that at Care Group, right? We were saying that there's a difference between you're acting foolishly and then calling someone a fool, right? Know, just for what it's worth. Um, so Saul is rejected as king. But, I mean, why? Did, did, did God change his mind? Like, I don't understand. I thought, I thought God made him king. Wasn't that like forever? Did, did God change his mind? I, I don't understand. What do you guys... What are your thoughts on that? Does God change his mind? Does he make mistakes? Did he not know that this was going to happen? He changed his mind? That's what you think? Okay. Anybody else? He don't. He don't change his mind. Yeah, he don't. He don't. <laughs> God doesn't. But again, we see time and time again, Right? God doesn't change his mind, but he responds to us as far as we are in whatever position we are. Like if our hearts are hardened towards God, then, you know, he's, he's going to try to soften our hearts. If we're repentful, right, then he can forgive us and restore us, right? If we reject God, right, that's, he's responding to our stance before him. Saul has said basically said publicly that he's rejecting God. He doesn't trust the way that God has said to do this, so he's taking matters into his own hands. He's the one stepping into the role of the priest and offering the sacrifices, which is not his job. And now God responds to the way Saul is before him. And that is not good for Saul, especially as a leader. And um, Samuel, I, even though it doesn't really say, well, it does later on. Samuel was angry um, am I jumping ahead or am I not jumping ahead? Yeah, jump ahead to 15 where it's more, more talk on Saul rejected as king. Samuel is upset about this because, like, I don't know if Samuel, like, had, like, a, he was campaign manager for Saul or whatever, but he was really, really upset about that, Right? In verse 10 of chapter 15, he says, The word of the Lord came to Samuel, and the Lord basically says, I regret that I made Saul king, for he has turned away from following me and not carried out my instructions. 
And so there we see it again. That, that, Saul, that was Saul's position. He turned away from the Lord, right? He can't do that as king, right? Look at the next part. So Samuel became angry and cried out to the Lord all night. Why do you think Samuel was angry? That what? I get angry when I disobedience. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way of looking at it. disobedience. He saw such blatant disobedience, right? And he was betrayed, right? You thought, that really, that especially what he did publicly, it was not only against God, it was against Samuel too, right? But he's anguished about this, and he cried out to the Lord all night. Right? It's a traumatic thing that's happening here, the failure of Israel's first king, and seemingly so quickly after he's been established in that, right? But Samuel's angry, right? Again, from our passage this week in Matthew, it's just like, if you're angry with your brother, right? But are we not supposed to be angry? Samuel's angry. It seems like, is there such a thing as righteous anger or? Yep. Yeah, there, there, there is a case of righteous anger and righteous indignation. I think this is a case of it. God, of course, gets angry. We know that. Um, but God is perfect and God is sinless. And so God's anger is always his holy anger and his holy wrath. There's no sin in it whatsoever. It's almost impossible for us to be angry and not sin, right? I think some of the catalyst to this could be uh, righteous, Like if we see oppression, if we see something that the Lord hates or we see sin or we see abuse or something, like, yeah, that's going to make us angry. But I think there's going to be a line very quickly where sin is going to come into it. Whatever that is, whether it's pride or whether you're going to try to add wrath to it or whether you are, um, you know, going to take it too far or whether you're going to make it prideful or whatever. So that's why that passage that Emily quoted in Ephesians be angry and do not sin, right? I think we talked about it on Sunday too. Don't let the sun go down on your angry anger. You have to deal with that stuff quickly because it's going to turn into sin because we are sinful creatures, right? But Samuel, this is like in the middle of chapter 15, right? This is the whole thing. It's, <laughs> it's like now he says, he kind of gives them, even though he, he knows the kingdom is going to be taken from him, he has this whole thing with the Amalekites and he says, look, you have to go take care of the Amalekites, Saul. So take the whole army, and, and you're going to pour out God's wrath on them. It's one of those tough things, and we saw it in Joshua, but he says, you're going to completely destroy them. You have to destroy all of them. This is, this is my vengeance on them for what they have done to me and what they've done to Israel, right? But does Saul do that? No. Saul decides to spare the king and he takes the best of the sheep, the goats, the cattle, the choice animal, as well as the young rams and the best of everything else. They were not willing to destroy them. Right? And this is again where Samuel is just like, Saul, what are you? You know? I love this. In verse 12, in the morning, Samuel got up after praying all night, after being uh, angry all night. He gets up in the morning to confront Saul. And when Samuel came to him, Saul said, May the Lord bless you. <laughs> it's just like, how was your sleep? You look well today. Like, you know, obviously there's a huge conflict and he's just trying to, you know, gloss right over that. And he says, oh, also, by the way, I have carried out the Lord's instructions. And CSB, unfortunately, translates it differently. But the one that's sticking in my mind is where Samuel says, then what is this bleeding of sheep I hear in my ears? I love, I absolutely love that. Picture like all the, all the hundreds of sheep and everything else that Saul just kept for himself. It's like, what is that? What is, if you carried out the Lord's instructions, then what is that? Right? He's just doing a pathetic job of trying to, to handle it. 
And he calls, in verse 15, Saul's like, oh, the troops brought them from the Amalekites. Blame my people, right? And spared the best. They did it. But, you know, the rest of everything else we took care of. But, you know, I mean, there were such nice sheep and everything, and we didn't want to lose them. And Samuel just says in 16, stop it. In verse 16, like, actually gives him a stop it, honey. He says, stop. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And then he goes on to tell him. And he's like, this is, this is, this is, he told you what to do. You didn't do it. The Lord anointed you king over Israel. He sent you on a mission. And you, why didn't you obey the Lord? And Samuel says, or Saul says again in verse 20, but I did obey the Lord. No, you didn't. You really, really didn't. Right? And then Samuel gives him a lecture. In verse 22, he says, Does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obeying the Lord? And he says, Look, to obey is better than sacrifice. Like, apparently Saul just gathered all those sheep and goats and everything else because maybe he thought, this would be awesome. I mean, I know the Lord told me to destroy them, but wouldn't he also really like if I just sacrificed them to him? Yeah, <laughs> maybe he's thinking on his feet, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Samuel. I mean, I, I, I disobeyed the Lord because, yeah, that's what I was doing. Yeah, I was going to make sacrifices. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> like a second in command is whispering in his ear, tell him it's a sacrifice. Right? And, and Samuel's like, that's not, what, that's not the point. God doesn't want your worship if your heart is not aligned with him. And we talked about that on Sunday again. Like, don't even bother. Does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obeying him? And he says, no. And, and Saul finally comes to his senses and realizes in verse 24 that he sinned, but it's too late. But he says also, he confesses. He goes, I was afraid of the people, so I obeyed them. Right. Um, the idea that when we give in to fear, worry, and anxiety, right, we make terrible decisions. And I think Saul shows that he's not fit for command in the way that he gave in to that. Side note, Samuel, just one of the manliest men ever, says, oh, by the way, where's the king of the Amalekites? Because I heard you spared him too. Right, so then Samuel goes in verse 33, goes, gets the king, and then hacks Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgar. That's a man right there. He's like, I will take care of this. You didn't. Somebody give me a sword. Let's go. All right, last little chapter. We're going to do 16 chapters in 17 minutes. <laughs> the reign of David comes in in chapter 16. So this is the man after the Lord's own heart that Samuel has talked about, right? So David is anointed. That whole famous scene in chapter 16, 1 through 13, where uh, Samuel goes out. He says, fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. Selected a king from his sons, right? Last week we were talking about uh, Ruth. And how the child became Obed, the father of Jesse, right, where we are now. Samuel says, I'm not going. In case you didn't notice, Saul and I are fighting, and Saul has lots of men with swords. And if I leave this house, he's going to try to kill me. And the Lord says, forget it. It's not going to happen. You're going to go. So he goes. Verse 7, after he gets there, uh, the Lord says to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his stature because I've rejected him. Humans do not see what the Lord sees, for humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. So what a great encouragement to us. That, you know, the, the world has their own standards, right, of what's powerful, of what's good, of what's awesome, but our Lord God looks at the heart, right? And we saw that last week. We're going to see it this week in Matthew with adultery, it's going to be a super uncomfortable sermon. It's going to be great, right? The idea that it's about the heart. It's not about these structures of the world, right? And you know the stories. Um, 
he goes out, he gets all the guys, all of them look stronger and healthier than the next guy, and he's got, nobody's the guy, do you have anybody left? And he's like, well, I got David, but he's out with the sheep, like he's the runt of the family, bring him in. And he sees it, he, and, and he says in verse 12, the end, the Lord said, anoint him for he is the one. And that is, that's David becoming anointed to be the king. Saul, uh, David then uh, comes to work for Saul in this really weird thing because David is not only a shepherd, he's not only going to become the best warrior that Israel has ever had, but apparently he's also a sick musician too. So he's like some, he's, so Saul has these panic attacks, right? And he's like, I need music. I need somebody to come and play. Who can do this? Oh, I know this kid, David. So then David starts to work for King Saul in it and playing music whenever Saul gets crazy in the head David starts playing, and it calms him down. Right? So David actually starts uh, working in the service of the king. Imagine being David, and imagine knowing that you're going to be king, that you've been told that you're going to be king, and your job is to play the harp for the current crazy king every time he has an episode. It, yeah. And, and that went on and on and on. And as we're going to see in a few moments, like now, suddenly Saul then realizes it. And now it's Saul's life mission then to kill David. So now David still knows he's king, but now he's running from his very life. Think about that. Sometimes we get weird and stressed about where the Lord has us in life. I and mean, we look at the biblical characters and we look at where David is and how much, that have, how much he must have depended on the Lord in that. Chapter 17, very famous and very, very misunderstood, David and Goliath. Very much wrongly interpreted. Anybody know a wrong interpretation? Anybody ever heard a wrong interpretation of this? Yes, Emily. We can defeat our... Our giant, whatever our giant is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so you will hear very, very well-intentioned, but very, very misguided interpretations of the story that says exactly what Emily said, that, that, you know, we're David, and if we just, we're strong, and we can defeat any giant that's standing in our way, whether it's a bad job or whatever, you know, if we just have strength, and, and Emily's exactly right. We're not David in this story. We're Israel. We're the ones that are hiding in the bushes, and, and Jesus is the one who comes in and saves us, right? So this points to Jesus. This doesn't, that interpretation makes us look good. And we're, we're, Jesus is the one that saves us when we were sinners and we rejected him. So, yeah, absolutely. If you ever hear any preacher say that, you are not in the right place. Okay. David and Goliath, um, once again, God's plan succeeds, okay, because God is sovereign. He would not let David be killed by Goliath anyway. It's an awesome story. I don't have time to go into it. Culminating with, once again, David cutting off Goliath's head and going back to his tent. I just absolutely love that. Um, you have this big section in the middle here of 18 through basically 29, which is basically David running for his life from King Saul. That's all, it's nine chapters worth of this, right? Where, where, where David is trapped and he escapes and where uh, King Saul comes out with his army. Um, again, imagine that. Imagine that. You have been anointed king by Samuel, by the big dog, right? You've been anointed king, but now you are running for your life. You're not just having a stressed out day. You have an army of trained killers who wake up in the morning and it's their job to find you and kill you. And you run and you run and you run, probably for years, right? And oh, by the way, in the middle of it, you're writing Psalms <laughs> as your little diary of, of how all this feels, right? And David holding to his integrity. David several times 
had Saul dead to rights and could have easily killed him, but he didn't. Why didn't he? Yeah, because he was God's king, right? It's where we get that famous kind of taken out of context saying, touch not the Lord's anointed, right? He's, I'm not going to do that. He's the Lord's king. And what was that really saying, though? He respected God's sovereignty. He respected God's sovereignty. He respected God. This is the man God has in charge. I know even though God says that I am the one soon to be, I'm going to respect who is still in charge right now. Yeah. Do you think that David had some sense during that time when he was running for his life that, I mean, he knew that God said he was going to be king, that he, he maybe didn't think they were going to succeed in killing him? Yeah, maybe. And knowing that the Lord was protecting him? Yeah, I mean, I think David had such a trust in the Lord. I think we'll see that in a couple other places. Whether or not that translated into, he can't touch me anyway, um, I don't know. Um, I, you, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure like, Yeah. David was a man after God's heart, right? And so David probably trusted the Lord maybe more than any other mere mortal, right, in that. Um, and that's why he was God's anointed. And that's why he led Israel into the golden years and on everything they did because it was fierce trust in the Lord. Yeah, Em. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, that's, that's just huge. And I think one of the beautiful parts of Scripture is that we see all of that, right? You know, we see schizo David. We see, like, where can I go from your presence? You're always with me. And then, where are you? Like, I'm going to die out here. What, are you not listening? Like, how long? Are you, uh. We totally understand that, Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I alternate between those several times a day. Like, you know, we can totally understand that. That's, yeah, it's... Can you imagine, like, him thinking, like, he's running like he's insane, running like he's running from the king, now the king wants to kill him, and he's like, yeah. oh, my gosh, this is, I don't know, this is crazy. Yeah, in that, somehow David keeps coming back. I think when we were in Psalms, I kind of referred to it as, like, the, he keeps surfacing. He keeps popping back up to the surface. He'll have those moments of complete and total meltdown, but then he'll pop back up, and he'll remember who God is, and he'll bring himself to God. I mean, some of the laments in the Psalms are just, the, you can hear him, his, his heart and his soul are just empty and dry, but then he pops back up because he remembers who his God is, and he laments to his God, right? Yeah, I think if anybody had the opportunity to take things into his own hand, it was David. Like, he was a warrior. Like, wasn't there one scene where Saul's, like, going to the bathroom in the cave and David's right there? I mean, like, he could have literally killed him. And nobody would have cared because this whole man, all his men would have been like, yeah, but he wouldn't do it. He would not take matters into his own hands. As opposed to Saul, the psycho who couldn't wait for Samuel to show up to give the sacrifice. So he did it himself, right? So there's a lot of, um, I don't know what the word is. It just ran out. A lot of comparison here between Saul and David that, that we're doing in the word of God in this. Um, I outran my notes, so I'm just going to catch up here. Yeah, so it, Scripture gives us plenty of of permission 
to have those moments where we're afraid, where we're depressed, where we're scared, where we're thinking God has left us, but we turn back to God. You know, I think that's why these things are in God's word, because we could see David walk these things out. And as human beings, we walk those things out all the time. We get it, right? We get it. This, they're real. They're raw. They're real life. And this is what King David, the greatest man in Israel's history, save Moses, right? This is what, was, what it was like for him. And again, the, the contrast of Saul's increasing irrational paranoia that we see, maybe even culminating in, in chapter 22, where he actually kills the priests of the Lord because they helped David. Like, how unhinged are you going to be that you are going to kill the priests of the Lord because they helped David? They're like, it's like, come on now. And... Um, at the end in uh, verse chapter, well, chapter 30, we see a very, very, we see a great contrast, just really briefly, with David and his Amalekites, right? Um, chapter 30, David and his men arrived in Ziklag on the third day. The Amalekites had raided the Negev and attacked and burned Ziklag. They also had kidnapped the women and everybody in, the, everybody in it from the youngest to oldest. They had killed no one but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men arrived at town, they found it burned. They found their wives, their sons, their daughters had been kidnapped. David and the troops with him wept loudly until they had no strength left to weep. Verse 6, David was in an extremely difficult position because the troops talked about stoning him. For they were all very bitter over the loss of their sons and daughters. Now just pause there for a second, right? Saul didn't even get to this point. Saul was just afraid because all his men were afraid of the Philistines. And he took matters into his own hands. And what does that last part of verse 6 say? This is the character of David. This is why he's a man after his own heart, after God's heart. He says, but David found strength in the Lord his God. Think about that. You got a guy in the loose with his army that's trying to kill you. You got your army. Now your army wants to kill you. And oh, by the way, all of your wives, all of your kids, all of everything else, everything's gone. There's probably not a lower point than that that you could be at. And again, we see the character of David shining through. He said, David found strength in the Lord his God. And he asks for the ephod, which is basically prayer and seeking the Lord. David turns to the Lord. And then David uh, defeats the Amalekites. And then in the last chapter, we have the death of Saul in chapter 31. But again, I think, I think a good place to land the plane is the contrast of David and Saul. The contrast of David anchoring his trust in the Lord his God, no matter what was going on around him, especially in that last chapter 30. The lowest of the low. And now comparing Saul in complete and utter selfish paranoia. Right? And which one is the one that's the man after God's own heart? Right? Doesn't say that David doesn't have his down times and his crazy times and his, his times of despair. That's all allowed. Right? And sometimes in Christianity we think like that stuff's not allowed. It's allowed. It's in, <laughs> look at David. It's allowed. But David keeps relying on the Lord through those things. That's why he's a man after God's own heart. So, questions, comments, disparaging remarks. <laughs> when she finds out what the word disparaging means, we're all in trouble. Or I'm in trouble. So 1 Samuel, I found, uh, I found old notes from, I guess, when I went through this a couple of years ago, and it was, it was Ruth, 1 Samuel, and 2 Samuel, and I was like, what? Like, how on, what was this, a four-hour Sunday school class? Like, how in the world could you do all that? I don't remember. Yeah.
Yeah. No, definitely not. Definitely not, right? And we'll see by far, David is not going to be perfect and, and there's going to be serious sexual sin. Yep, yep. And that's, polygamy is weird for us too as Americans because we're just like, Ugh, like, you know, it, it's the, that reaction, like, Bleh. like, why would you want to do um, But it's, Again, it's it, God even uses that, he uses that sin in the population of his nation, right? It was never his plan, but even though he stands behind that and it's repulsive to us, but still somehow God uses the evil in people's hearts. But it definitely sets the tone for sexual sin within his family, uh, which we'll see is going to have devastating results, so... Yeah, Abigail. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> isn't there a great? There's a great verse in there. There it is, verse three. And CSB cleans it up too much. ESV is a little funnier. It says, the woman was intelligent and beautiful, but the man, a, Caleb, a Calebite, was harsh and evil in his dealings. Anybody have something different for that? Surly. Surly. <laughs> it's like, the woman was intelligent and beautiful, but the man was a big jerk. <laughs> it's basically what it says. <laughs> yeah, it almost, I think he ends up dying, right? She ends up becoming married to David. See, women are smarter. <laughs> All right. Well, another successful midweek. Let me pray for us. Then I'll return you to your Wednesday evenings. Father, we, uh, we thank you for your word. And, and Lord, we thank you that it is so deep that we can spend hours uh, reading one verse and meditating on one verse. And we also can glean themes and other things in your character and your character of your people from going through your word at a higher level. And Lord, even as we remember bits and pieces of your word throughout the day, you encourage us and you strengthen us. Let us live our lives by your word in, in all ways. Let us remember your word um, may we store it in our hearts so that we don't sin against you. And Lord, may we, may we be like David in the sense that we are people after your own heart, that we trust you, that Lord, even in those moments of darkness, that they're okay, but, but we, we come back to you and we would trust in the name of the Lord our God. Let us be characterized as, as people after your own hearts because of our trust in you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.